It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah. My microphone's too hot. And welcome. <laughs> Stop it, band. Welcome to the big show, you guys. Um, I saw you guys in the chat room talking about Glenn Fry passing away today. Um, for those of you who may not know, which seems impossible, Glenn Fry from the Eagles um, passed away today, which is very sad. He was only 67 years old. Um, anybody who knows me would tell you that I'm a huge Eagles fan, and uh, I was very fortunate in the very, very early stages of my career to be... Uh, I had to do some food runs for them at Criteria Studios back in the day and got to hang out with them a lot because they were there doing the One of These Nights record. As a matter of fact, the first time I ever set foot in a legit studio is in the lobby of Criteria as a, a visitor and could hear the um, echo chamber, uh, live chamber above the um, lobby. And it had the snare drum and remember the take it to the limit snare drum had a super long like pre-delay on it and a ka um, and I think Randy Meisner's uh, high vocal was up there uh, as well in that chamber and you could actually hear it through the ceiling in the lobby so we will miss you Glenn uh, they'll never be able to replace him in the Eagles so very very sad uh, my guest is on her way, but uh, thank you, uh, 405 Traffic. She's stuck on the 405, which is a parking lot, because it's sprinkling outside. So I'm going to pad for time, and it's going to be Ask Michael Anything time uh, until she gets here. Uh, uh, our guest is Erin Jacobson. She was, uh, I did a one-on-one -on -one thing with her at the Road Rally. She's a music attorney here in Los Angeles. And we had so many people wanting to know about music library contracts. They were confused about certain clauses or concepts. So we actually had her on stage looking at clauses um, and, and telling folks what those clauses meant and discussing different aspects of music library contracts and the music library business in general. And she did such a great job. I remember I was running around in the audience uh, fielding questions with my uh, you know, wireless mic. And I remember at one point thinking, wow, she's really bright, really friendly, and, and you know, says it in plain English, not a bunch of legalese. So uh, I asked her if she'd like to join me for an episode of Taxi TV, and she will be here soon. So until then, hello, audience in the chat room. How are you guys? Hey, Amanda, Jesse, Gloria, Lou, Shane, Andy. How are you, Andy? Um, Sonalab. Anyway, uh, great to see you guys. Uh, it's Martin Luther King Day, so the office is just like really quiet. The phones are barely ringing. Um, everybody's kind of sitting around twiddling our thumbs. Um, okay, so Robbie Hancock says, Michael, my anything question is this. Please tell us your favorite Glenn Fry story. <sighs> okay, uh, got one for you. Um, so... At the time that I met them, I think I was 19 years old, so Glenn was six years older than I am, so he was just 25 years old. Um, the Eagles had already had a couple of big records out. Take It Easy had already been a huge hit. Um, and like I said, they were uh, doing final overdubs, vocals, and then mixing one of these nights at the studio where I worked. Um, and, and when they did the first uh, first date of the tour, it was actually at the Miami High Life Fronton, and they invited the entire staff to come, and we got to sit like right in front of the mixer, dead center in the room. Amazing concert. Uh, I've seen the Eagles probably six times since then. Always amazing. Anyway, so, you know, they were young, cool guys with long hair. Um, Might have been a little partying going on from time to time. They were living the life, uh, definitely living the life. And uh, no pretense, you know, they just wore jeans, cowboy boots, t-shirts, um, sometimes looked like they might not have showered for a day or two, a uh, little road worn, um, or been up all night for other reasons, which I don't want to talk about because this is a family show. Anyway, uh, Glenn, Glenn was a good looking man. Let's just say Glenn at 25 years old, Glenn at any age, pretty good looking guy. So he had no problem with the ladies. And I noticed that he would pull into the parking lot with these 
gorgeous, like breathtaking, beautiful young ladies all the time. And one day uh, I was probably picking up a pizza box in their control room or something. And I said something about, wow, another beautiful young lady today. And he said, yeah, I only date uh, playmates. And I said, really? And I came to find out that he only dated playmates that were like playmate of the month a month or two before that. And so he was on this playmate run. Um, an adjunct to that uh, is he collected hotel room keys from nights in hotels on the road where there was a lot of fun activity going on in his rooms and he would keep the keys. Remember back when keys weren't cards, they were an actual key on like a key, plastic key fob. So he had like two Adidas bags filled with keys that represented a fun night on the road for Mr. Glenn Fry. And there were a lot of keys in those bags. So there you go, my two Glenn Fry stories. Um, so now that I've uh, exposed the seedy underbelly of rock and roll in 1974, 75, um, yeah, Jesse says life in the fast lane. Oh yeah, definitely life in the fast lane. So ask me questions about anything. Hey Mojo, um, those records, he says those records were a huge part of my adolescence and he's still loving it. All right, Aaron is here already. Come on in, Aaron. <laughs> good timing. I just started padding for time by oh, telling good. Glenn Fry and Eagle stories. I know, Yay. That was awful. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let me All right, take your time. I'm going to, I'll take another question or two while okay. you're doing that. Okay, so Aaron is here. That's great. Um, am I really that old? Yes, I am. Um, I'm really, really old. Um, any other actual music business questions, guys? <laughs> no, not yet. Come on. Crank them out. <laughs> That's all right. Take your time. <laughs> I'm just sitting here waiting for a question, you guys. Come on. Somebody's got to have something. Uh, what are you guys doing on uh, Martin Luther King Day? Are you guys all taking off of work? Because I think half of our staff is out today. Um, you ready? I'm ready. All I'm right. Ready. Come on oh, over. There's and water hit, for me already. Yes, I there's a water. I was asking 3A for water. I'll start the, the theme song okay. in the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Erin Jacobson. Yay! <laughs> Oops. Oh, they're clapping twice for you. <laughs> Two claps. That's good. <laughs> Isn't that the name of a band, Two Clubs? Oh, no, that's Tupac. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> hi, Erin. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Great to see I you. I made it through the parking lot known as the 405. Yes. Uh, for those of you yeah. who... Uh, come on in, Bria. I'm good. Uh, we're, we're good. We've got a water. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you who have never had the pleasure of driving in uh, Los Angeles, we have a freeway called the 405 that is world famous for its volume of traffic. Yes. And uh, then it dumps you onto the 101, which is also famous. So, Aaron is here. I'm here. Yes. Thankfully, <laughs> I made it. <laughs> uh, nothing worse, right? I know. It's just, like, it's just and it's a, it's a holiday, so you think there's not going to be traffic, and then I left in plenty of time, and of course, it was worse traffic than it, there usually is. Well, that's because so. it was sprinkling. I mean, it, if, it if we get like one ounce of water hitting a freeway out here, the freeway just locks up. Yeah. I, I, I think that the only days that the traffic you can count on it being light are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes Christmas. I've yes. had some light Christmas traffic, too. Yeah, but then right. everybody's going to, you know, Grandma's right. house. Right, exactly. It's okay, true. so, so uh, as I said yeah. before you got here, um, Aaron just did a great job at the Road Rally. And I, Thank I, you. I couldn't wait to have you to on there, the show. So. She, she was, I, I was just out in the audience smiling, just. <laughs> delighted it was a great you time just left me up there on stage and you're doing your Phil Donahue thing right. I think I could have gone home and then uh you know probably come back at the end of the 90 minutes and she yeah. would have still been there answering questions probably. so I'm gonna I'm gonna read to her yeah. bio before we continue uh she's a practicing attorney who protects musicians songwriters producers and a wide variety of other entertainment professionals she's a graduate of Southwestern Law School and of the University of Southern California her clients range from Grammy and Emmy Award winners to independent artists, record labels, music publishers, and production companies. You can find her on the internet at www.themusicindustrylawyer.com. Erin is an experienced deal, deal negotiator. 
quite a little hard. Well, I won't. <laughs> uh, and a seasoned advisor of intellectual property rights. She also owns and oversees all operations for Indie Artist Resource, which offers full service template contracts, which you guys should check out. You should definitely check out. <laughs> um, intellectual yeah. property registration services and legal and business consultations designed to meet the unique needs of independent musicians. So there she is, Erin Jacobson. I am. <laughs> so. We asked everybody to send um, questions Great. beforehand. People and, sent some to me, too. Oh, good, because so, we barely got any okay. on our social media. It I just got, goes to show you, social yeah. media is overrated. Um, do you want to, at the road rally, I yeah. probably spent 15 minutes on the stage giving this whole preamble, and then when I finally let you talk and you opened your mouth, I went, I'm an idiot. I should have let her <laughs> You're not an idiot. <laughs> well, I, I just, you were so good that I thought oh, I really you. didn't need to say that. So thank do you, you want to start out with uh, kind of an overview I mean, of I music can. libraries? How, how, when does the show go to? 5.30. 5.30, okay. Yeah. So we have more time than I thought. So that's good. I mean, I, I can do that if you want. Yeah, give a, a okay. I mean, most people that watch the show on a regular basis, and these are mostly regulars today, mm -hmm. um, tend to know what music <laughs> libraries okay. are. But... Uh, yeah, give a okay. little preamble. So first I have to give the legal disclaimer. Oh, yes, got to have the lawyer, disclaimer. Right? Right. Okay, so just I have to say this, guys. Anything I say is not legal advice during this show. I'm not acting as your attorney. Don't rely on my advice as if I were your attorney. Um, if you have an issue, seek the advice of an attorney um, that's licensed in your state because the law can vary based on what state you're in. And, and no matter what state you're in, they won't be as stringent as they are here in California. <laughs> Depending on what it is, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything I say is an advertisement, it's general in nature. Yes, I mean, it sounds weird, but I have to say all this stuff. And I could and, advertise and say, use her as your attorney. There you but go. She you can't you can advertise right. for me. Um, and then actually, because we're going to be talking about some specific contract language today, so I think people should be aware that 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 language is going to be kind of in a vacuum because people have sent in clauses or it's, you know, a particular thing and that that might not relate to your situation or it might actually be different than another part of a contract that I haven't seen because some people just right. said, here's this one paragraph, what does that mean? And that might, the meaning might vary based on another part of the contract that I haven't seen. So right. I'm, I'm just commenting on what is in front of me that people have sent in. So... That's, all right. that's with all the disclaimers. Stuff. All right. Without any so. further ado. <laughs> <laughs> and away we go. Yes. Okay. So, so music library deals, I mean, just for a general overview, there are contracts between songwriters and companies that, that own catalogs of music for the purpose of placing them in television and film and getting these synchronization licenses. And then, and actually I think, Something we touched on at the rally, but not as much, as, but I've been seeing it more and more even since the rally, is these libraries really are kind of wannabe music publishers, too. So a lot of the deals are kind of going in that direction where they're yeah, wanting to be administrators or they're wanting to... Yeah, she didn't mean want to be like, uh, want to be a rock star. She meant yeah. want to be like, they're, they're expanding their services right yeah. well because the value for them also is if they're owning copyright if they can build a catalog that creates value for them and then at some point they Somebody can maybe will buy them acqu acquire yeah. them exactly so um but the deals i mean the library deals can be lucrative if you get a good placement or it's a good company that has a lot of good contacts with supervisors and there are different negotiating points um but they, they differ a little bit because some are more like standalone songs. Like you'll give a library right. like three songs. And then others are more like I'll give you 100 cues and it's more like a production music or background music kind of library. And those libraries tend to license things more based on blanket licenses and things like that. Whereas like the individual song deals, it's more like they're trying to get individual placements right. for your song. So sometimes the terms vary based on those circumstances and, and a blanket license uh, i think most of you know this but just to clear it up a blanket license is when a company says here are ten thousand of our songs yeah. on a drive that's about the size of my phone right. and you can have all you can eat for the entire year for ten thousand right. dollars 
Some libraries do a better job of uh, disseminating that money out to the composers than others. Sometimes I've heard of situations where libraries will get the $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 check and then have some weird calculation where the musicians don't really get compensated for the use of their music and that, yeah. that becomes an issue. Right. So. That's an issue. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, while pretty much all of these deals deal with the composition, some of them also want master rights or the rights to be able to license the master as well. So that kind of depends on the deal also. Um, and then I think something that that's a big thing that, that we touched on at the rally was some of these deals are more negotiable than others. Um, and tell which, them why or why and when. Why or, and when, yeah. which, you know, is the answer to every legal question. It depends. Right. Um, but the ones, like we were just talking about those production music, those background music libraries, they deal in such volume that those are going to be less negotiable than some of the more single song agreements or, you know, fewer song, individual song agreements, mm -hmm. I guess you can call them. But, you know, I've negotiated both of those kinds of agreements. So I think it, a lot of times it just really depends on what company you're dealing with too. And how well established you are. Right. Because you could be doing instrumental cues, but you could be the master of that. Yeah. And yours are 25% better than other people's and right. they really want you in the catalog. So yes, Mr. X, we're going to give you a better deal for this large volume of cues based on the fact that you've got diamonds and other people have emeralds or something. Right. Like <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean, it just, there's so many factors that it depends on. And I just brought some examples. So if you're wondering why I'm looking down at the table. Um, so, and, and something that I talk about with my clients a lot is, which goes along with the negotiable, non-negotiable thing, but I'll, goes along with all the deal points is, is this really a good deal for you just in general? Because for my clients, that, especially my composer clients that have, you know, a hundred cues sitting on a hard drive that they're doing absolutely nothing with. Yeah. And, you know, we don't care as much about some of the deal terms because it's like, okay, well, they can sit on the hard drive and make no money or we can put them right. with this library and see if they do something. Versus a song versus, that you labored. Exactly. Yeah. Versus these songs that are your babies and you want to maybe get a real publishing deal or a record deal or something like that with them later. And do you really want to tie them up now? Or do you really want to be in a deal where you have to transfer part of your copyright to this library and then or all of it or all of it for no advance for no advance exactly and then that may prevent you from income from opportunities from making a deal later because of that so and, or it could be where that song sits there on your hard drive right. for the next three years and does nothing it's a tough right. call it's it is but i mean a, a lot of my clients they want to you know, they want to be able to do things so that for them, it's important to own their intellectual property. But for some people, it doesn't matter. I have other clients that are like, look, as long as it makes me money, I don't care. Give them the copyright. And so, they'll be writing more tomorrow. Exactly. Because some of my clients actually do make their living on writing for libraries and writing for sync placement. So for that, you know, it's like, all right, like you said, I'll write another one tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so it depends on what's right for each person in each person's career. And you could do, yeah. you know, six of this and two of that. Right. Uh, some of our more successful members tend to do some non-exclusive deals, mm -hmm. some exclusive deals. Um, they may come up with a song that they labored over for 40 hours one week that is, you know, a, a Latin piece with a, and they had to go out and get somebody to translate and sing it in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And they put a lot of effort into it. That They're going to cut a different deal for that and choose the library that it goes in based on which library is more likely to get them placements with that right. than, you know, right. instrumental, swampy instrumental keys. Right. And the thing with placements is that it's, you know, they're speculative because mm -hmm. it has to be the right project and the, the supervisor has to like it. And it's, um, you know, and I've had deals that we've done that, you know, they don't, you don't get a placement out of it. I mean, we spent all the time doing the deal and then a placement doesn't come through because it's, it's not that the music is placeable, but for whatever reason, the stars didn't align. So that brings up an interesting yeah. question, which is 
um, and this is not an advertisement for attorneys, but why would somebody want to spend, you know, several hundred dollars having an attorney review a contract? Not that I'm saying you shouldn't. Because you should. (laughs) But why... Because, well, because, Mike, I mean, I think I know where you're going here, is that on the other side of the coin, you might get a really good placement, and your song might be making a lot of money, and you might be stuck in a bad deal. Or you might want that song back at a later time, and if you would have had an attorney look at it to begin with, maybe that could have been negotiated into it, whereas maybe you didn't have somebody look at it, and you've given up your copyright for a $500 placement, and you want it back, and you can't, and there's no way out of it. Because I've had clients that have signed library deals before they've gotten to me and then they start telling me about it after they hire me and then I say this doesn't sound right send send these over let me look at them Mm -hmm. and then I've called them up and told them that a very not nice thing is happening to them right now (laughs) Which you, I won't say on the air. Uh, so, um, hmm, what letter of the alphabet right, might that begin with? Right, well, okay. exactly. So um, that's that's why you want to have it looked over. So it started with like the sixth letter of yeah, the alphabet. It's about there. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So it's. I am of the mind that if it's a large library that's been around for a very long time and you have five friends, 10 friends, Mm -hmm. 25 friends that have done business with that company for a period of years and it's for instrumental cues and the deal's not negotiable Mm because they deal in volume. Yeah. I would probably do that deal based on the advice of my friends who've had a long history and no problems. However, I'm not saying that they should never use an attorney. That's the kind of deal where maybe you could get away with that. But for a song that you put a lot of time and effort yeah. into and a lot of expense into, yeah, you've got a, 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 a very grown-up decision to make. Right. Is that the right library for me, number one? Do they have a history of placing songs in you know, montages at the end of Grey's Anatomy? Mm-hmm. Or are they mostly a library that gets a lot of instrumental cue placements? Right. So you got to know that you're going to the right, right place. And then exactly. once you've decided that that library looks like it's attractive to you for those reasons, then you would want Aaron or somebody like her to look at the deal and go, if they want the song that badly, maybe we can get you a better deal. Right. And I just had that conversation a couple weeks ago with with a client. And I said, and it was like a low threshold for copyright transfer. And I said, do you really want to give up your copyright for that amount of money? So it was basically one of those deals, like if we get you a placement where you get 500 bucks for a sync fee, then then we own it for life. Yeah, exactly. And I said, you know, is it... Is it worth it? Are these are these songs important? How important are these songs to you? Is it worth it to give it up for five hundred dollars? Mm-hmm. And you know, my client had to think about that for a while. So, and I'm waiting for the answer right now. I'm still thinking <laughs> so about it. Still thinking about it. Wow. Um, but but those are the kind of decisions that you have to make in these situations because if it really is these songs that you've put a lot of effort into, is it? You know, and maybe you could do something else with them. Is it worth it to give it up for a few hundred dollars? If you think there's yeah. a, a real probability or possibility yeah. that you can, um, I'm also of the mind that yeah. I, I see people that get very precious about something yeah. and it sits on the and shelf. Sometimes you need to be not as precious. Yeah, yeah, because you I will agree. write another great song right. at some point. Maybe right. a lot of them, but it, it's a tough call. Yeah, um, do some of everything. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of the individual song deals is you can actually give them just a couple songs and mm-hmm. see how it goes. And maybe they're not your most important songs. Um, and, and you can earn your way into their heart. Um, right. You may start out with not a great deal for the first two or three times around. Right. And the library owner uh, slash publisher finds out that you're eminently placeable. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a lot of activity. At that point, isn't it a fair statement to say you can probably negotiate a better deal on your 5th or 10th or 20th tune because they they know you're good? Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, No, I mean, if you have a question, go um, for it. um, If not, I'll just carry on. Carry on. (laughs) So, I mean, one thing we touched on this a little bit is exclusive versus non-exclusive deals. So, right. so exclusive deals is this one company has the exclusive right to be 
the representative for licensing your music. And the benefit to that is that's the only place that people can license your music, so they may be able to command a higher licensing rate. And also, uh, sometimes they have a smaller catalog, so you might get some more individual attention. But then on the other side of that is the non-exclusive deals where you can give more than one company the right to pitch your music. And the benefit to that is that more than one company is pitching your music, so it gets out there, hopefully, mm -hmm. more. But the detriment to that is also that more than one company is pitching your music. Because if three different companies pitch your music to a supervisor and they're all asking for different licensing fees and the supervisor wants that they're gonna go with the company that's asking for the lowest licensing fee so you've actually undercut your own rate by having these multiple people and it could pitch be a, it could be a no sync fee deal and it could be yeah. exactly and if you have one company that's saying oh yeah we'll we'll do it for for free you know which you know, that's a whole other topic. And it's you know? becoming, it's, you know, the norm yeah, these days, yeah, sadly. Yeah, which is unfortunate. But, but yeah, I mean, you could have one company, you know, asking for $1,000 and another company asking for 500 and another company saying, oh, well, we'll do it without a sync fee because of the, the promotion and the exposure. And the supervisor is going to go, great, I don't have to pay for that one. I'll take that company. Right. So... Um, so there's that issue. There's the issue of if a supervisor doesn't want your song and then three different companies are pitching it to them, they're going to get annoyed because mm -hmm. they don't have time for that. Um, and then for the ones where they are paying, sometimes when there's multiple companies, it becomes a who pitched it first right. thing. So because each company is going, well, I sent that to you first, so I should be the one to get paid. Yeah, they practically yeah. have to timestamp them when right. they receive them. I right. guess they do have a timestamp yeah. if they're getting it digitally right. You know, right. online. But, but um, who the hell wants to take the time to exactly. sort Exactly. Supervisors that out. don't want to do that. Right. So, so a lot of them will say, if it's not exclusive, we don't even want to deal with it because we don't want to be caught up in the drama of who pitched it first. And on the yeah. flip side of that, I've got, we had two taxi members on the mm -hmm. show about a year and a half or so ago. Um, one of the guys is probably in his late 40s, I'm okay. guessing. The other one is about 30 years old. And they're both shining examples of guys who have everything in non-exclusive catalogs. Mm -hmm. They mostly do instrumental, occasionally a song. Um, I would... I actually know how much they make, and they talked about it in general terms on the show. So yeah. I'm gonna, they said they make as much as a U.S. senator, which I think is 180 grand okay. a year. One of the guys makes more than that, and the other one makes a little less than that. Okay. But in anyway. either way, it's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, right? you know, yeah. like a, a nice six-figure yeah. income, uh, and everything they own is in non-exclusive catalogs, mm -hmm. and even some really crummy non-exclusive catalogs. I mean, there are you know what I would call Cadillac non-exclusive mm -hmm. companies. And then there are other ones I just look at and go, God, it's right. barely a company. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a database of music online that mm -hmm. anybody can download and pay mm -hmm. for with a credit card. And I don't love those companies most of the time. And these guys are both earning two of the best incomes that I know of amongst all the people I know, which is quite, quite a few, um, hundreds, thousands, yeah. that are making money with film and TV right. stuff. So it's working for them. On the flip side of that, we've got another member who also earns a six-figure income that does exclusive deals sometimes. He does non-exclusive right. other times. And when he does a non-exclusive deal, he treats it as if it's exclusive. So he won't put okay. it in five catalogs. Right. But he'll sign a non-exclusive okay. deal and let him retitle it, but he won't put it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so it can work right. for anybody, but... We have this little thing called um, what? What do they call it? Uh, recognition software, um, right? Audio. Recognition software. Yeah. yeah, and how is that going to mess things right. up when you've got the same exact song, right. the same mix, the same everything, and it's now in four or five places? Right, and that was that was one of my points that I was going to bring up. Is so you have for for people that aren't familiar with the technology, basically it's um, it's a technology that listens to whatever the song is. So if, if you write a song, and I always give the example with the very original title of Love Song because there's no songs in the music <laughs> business about love. Never. Um, but, and, and then you put it with the library 
that library is going to title it something like love song dash the name of the library or you know whatever little code they have or something and so when this software listens to the song they don't know which version it is because it's the same song it just has a different title so then it becomes well is it do you pay the original version of the song or do you pay this library for this retitled version of the song so what do the, they do well they're still relying on the cue sheets which okay. is what they've been doing for right. you know for however long um but i mean yeah that's basically they're they're still relying on the cue sheets which are reliant yeah. upon assistance filling right. out the cue sheets right um but the thing is is like it's even Worse, when when you're in a non-exclusive situation, when you have given a song to like three or four or five different libraries, and they're all retitling it. So then yeah. you have like five different versions. Well, who gets paid? I don't know. <laughs> then you have to go back to the cue sheets and see, okay, well, what what is this usage? Okay, this was a performance on such and such TV show. Okay, well, that was on that network. That was placed with that library. Okay. So you have to figure it out that way. And um, it might only be a $3.50 cent payment right. that you're due so who's going to want to spend the time to go down that road right. for three and yeah, a half bucks have fun with that. <laughs> yeah or, or 27 cents yeah yeah our yeah. industry's a mess yeah it little, really it's is it's a little messy i mean i think it'll work itself out but it's a little messy right now so, so yeah oh i just had such a great question i lost it so go ahead all right I'll try think and, of I'll, it it'll I'll, come back to you so yeah. Basically, um, so the next point I was going to make was um, payments. You know, usually the deals with the more reputable companies are 50-50 income split. And then the library will want 100% of the publisher's share of per public performance royalties. And then the writer will keep 100% of the writer's yeah. share of public performance. So it works out to 50 Yeah. So, I mean, but in that sense, that's only for the performance royalties that's not the mechanical royalties that's not the other royalty streams so um and the mechanicals don't often come into play with library no, stuff yeah uh, no, first of all so they much. don't even come into play much anymore for well, big hit songwriters right, but it, they do come into play when it's those libraries that want to be the publishers right you know or the libraries that have taken part of the copyright or all of the copyright so then you know they kind of are the ones that can sometimes collect but only yeah. if they get it on something that would pay a mechanical right like a right. beyonce album right which gosh who was i talking to the other day i can't remember somebody who's a big hit songwriter saying you know um they still make great money oh it's jason bloom yeah. he's telling me how you know he still makes great money from performances on radio mm -hmm. but as far as mechanical goes Right. You know, it's, album sales are down so right. so much right. that it yeah, that's not doesn't even it's anymore. not the major income stream for an artist anymore. Whereas yeah, you know, sad. That's yeah, that's that's another issue. Yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then as we you know we've mentioned several times, it's these libraries often some of them don't want copyright, and those are usually the non-exclusives. But some of them want usually half the copyright, sometimes all of the copyright. Usually it's no advance in the deal. Sometimes it's, as we mentioned, you know, if we get you a placement for such and such amount of money, then that triggers the transfer of the copyright. Otherwise it might revert in three years or some period of time. If, if, they, if nothing... Depending on the deal. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, they don't all have... I mean, usually, yeah, I mean, usually it's like if we don't get you a placement or we don't get you a placement of a, a certain income threshold, then the copyright won't transfer. So then, you know, when the deal's over, so it's it still yours. Right, but if really the copyright have to revert because it was never there. Right, so. it was never there, exactly. But if the copyright does transfer, then that's usually for in perpetuity for the rest of time. And that's um, a word we get asked about a yes, lot. Yes, and I just wrote an article about that. So it's on my website. You yeah. should send me your articles, okay. and every now and then I will put them in our newsletter. Oh, okay. It goes yeah. out to a huge number that. of these yeah. guys. My pleasure. Um, let's talk about yes. something that we spoke about at the Road Rally, okay. which is the kind of publishing admin services that are mm -hmm. offered by, I think, TuneCore, TuneCore. Um, CD yeah. Baby, many other companies. I had a, right. an incident where, not that long ago, a couple of shows taxi tv shows where i played taxi members music here's the stuff that got forwarded here's the stuff that wasn't 
And it was before anybody had signed a deal. Some of those people ended up getting deals. Their stuff went into a, a catalog, and the publisher then registered the stuff as copyrighted. And, and um, YouTube eventually muted our show mm. because my show contained copyrighted material. Right. So I think people are signing these deals without considering... They look at it and go, oh, another company that can make me money for my music. Right. But there are many ways they can get screwed. Not that these companies like to encore CD Baby are trying to right. screw anybody. It's just you've really got to understand publishing and know what you're signing and right. should see an attorney on that one. Yeah, definitely. Well, so, I mean, in that sense, it's not that, the like you said, it's not that the companies are trying to screw people over because, I mean, I don't have anything against to encore CD Baby. I mean, they provide a very good service. Um, but the thing is, is you have to understand what you're signing because it's online. It's, th this is a non-negotiable situation and it's like, click the button to agree. And people are like, yeah, okay, click. Right. And, I don't um, even think they get yeah, 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 okay, yeah, they right. just click. Click, yeah. I agree, okay. So, Which does hold up in court. With, yeah, and the thing is, is that, so like for TuneCore, for example, so I've, somebody sent us the administration amendment to the TuneCore terms and conditions for the publishing side. Now, this doesn't apply as much if you're just using them for your online distribution for like iTunes, Amazon, that kind of thing. But if you opt into their publishing side, then this was effective as of December 12, 2013. So, um, and it reads very similarly to a typical publishing administration deal that you would sign with a music publisher. Um, so I'll, I, I printed it out, so I'll go over some of the relevant language so you can pick out words. Um, so basically in the very beginning, under the grant of rights paragraph, it says by clicking I agree, you grant to TuneCore, um, which they reference as the, the company, um, throughout the world during the administration term, the sole and exclusive right, so there you go, you're in an exclusive deal, to be the administrator of the musical compositions owned or controlled by you, et cetera, et cetera. There's other language. But um, so your musical compositions are now exclusively controlled by TuneCore as your music publisher. So that yeah. means that if this person who signs that deal meets a music supervisor, or no, uh, meets the owner of a big music library. I love your yeah. music. I want to put it in my library. They can't now because right. TuneCore has the exclusive right. Right, and there's more because really one of the functions of a music publisher is to get placements mm -hmm. for for their clients and their writers. And so libraries came in kind of doing this placement thing, and then they were like, oh, but the value is really in owning the copyright. So then we'll, you know, act like a music publisher too. And now I'm seeing these hybrid deals that are like part publishing deal and part library deal. And they call it, you know, like I've seen them, it's like they call it a co-pub deal. And it's like, no, that's really not a co-pub deal. <laughs> and a co-pub deal, for those who might yeah. not know, is where you keep some percentage, usually 50% of your 50%. publisher share. And the publisher gets 50% of the publisher's well, the share. Of the copyright. Of the copyright. Yeah. And, and you would keep um, the whole writer's share. Yeah, but I mean, that's when you talk about the writer publisher share in that sense, it's kind of more about performance, right? right. So, so they'll split, usually in a traditional co publishing deal, they'll split the copyright 50 50, and then the income will be split 75% to the writer, 25% to the publishing company. Right. Um, and then. Depending on the deal, you know, you see how certain, I mean, sometimes they have carve outs for certain things, but, um, but like in this deal, for example, this is more of an administration deal and we'll get to the percentages in a minute, but it's like a 90, 10 split and okay. they're not taking the copyright and that's consistent with a traditional administration deal. And the 10 publishing. goes to the admin company. Correct. The and 90 the 90 going, going to the, the writer. writer. Um, but you know, still in this grant of rights area of the contract, um, so they say that you know, the the publisher has the right to license and cause others to license and collect all income related to the exploitation of the compositions, and the company has the right to broadcast the performance to to license broadcast and digital public performances, to license the manufacturer reproduction distribution for sale. And the synchronization of compositions in connection with, but not limited to, motion pictures, television programs, advertisements, and video games. So there's your your synchronization 
functions of, of what a library would be doing. And then further down in the contract, TuneCore actually has a, like an online, they call it an online sync store, um, which is one of those online things where you can go on the website and they have all their tracks and supervisors or whoever wants to license music can go and listen to the different tracks and see, you know, if any are right for their project and license them through the website. Without dealing with a human being at all. Yeah. So, um, so that's taking care of all this placement kind of stuff. So like you said, if some library comes and says, I want your music in my library, and you go, okay, well, you're, you're now you're infringing. Big trouble, you're yeah. now, yeah, you're now breaching your TuneCore deal that you said that you agreed that they could be your exclusive administrator. And here's where it could get hairy, because not only have you done something dopey, but you've done something that can cost you a lot of money because you could end up signing both of those deals. You've signed this one first, right. you sign signed the library deal second. Let's say that library owner, owner gets you a $100,000 placement in a Cadillac TV commercial. Right. These guys are going to come after their piece, and they're right. going to go to war with the publisher on that, and you're going to be stuck in the middle because you right. signed both of those. Right, so yeah. So, I mean, that's you need to know what you're signing, and that's having an attorney look at it for you. So, um, you know, so for the income we talked about is 90-10, but in this particular deal for the synchronizations and any cover songs that they get, it's actually an 80-20 split instead of a 90-10 split because, you know, they're putting in some extra effort there. They're not just managing it. They're, right. you know, they're going out and trying to get something for you. Um, and then what other language did we pick out that's... Um, Oh, and then the term, you know, which is another thing to to pay attention to. So this particular deal, it's a term of one year, and then it automatically renews for one year periods after that, unless you give them notice within a particular period of time that you don't want the deal to continue. So, so that would probably be like 60 or 90 days out from the It's 60 days in this one particularly. But yeah, sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's 30. It depends on the Prior deal. Prior to the anniversary of the deal. Exactly. Okay. But, you know, if you don't do anything, it just keeps going and going and going and maybe you thought oh it's a one-year term and then you think after one year you can go sign with the library or do something else but you can't because it, unless you notify them it just it keeps going oops yep <laughs> a little bit of an oops there yeah um so i mean that those are the major points of of a deal like a tune core kind of thing do you want to jump into to some more questions um, that you have there yeah, this is, this is a good That's question. A good one, this right. one's from Brandon Sturiali. Hi, Brandon. Uh, Brandon, <laughs> do you have a relative named Pat? Because many, many, many years ago, like 35 years ago, I worked with, I got a brand new pair of roller skates, Melanie, and her background singer was Pat Sturiali. And this is the only other Sturiali I've ever met. So, Brandon, if you're watching the show yeah. and you're related Let to us Pat, know. yeah, got to know that because Pat was a sweetheart. Okay, uh, Brandon asks, I was recently contacted by a music library after being forwarded by taxi, and the clause in their contract said this is an exclusive contract in your song or songs, cannot then be placed with any other library or organization or sold or marketed by yourself or any third party. My issue is that the song is on an album of mine that I released in 2014. Does this mean I can no longer promote and sell my album, or should they get a cut of all the albums they sell in the future? Surely not. I would love clarification on that. My email to them uh, went unreturned. Oh, that's nice. um, it's the sold or marketed by yourself that's causing me alarm, but hopefully they just mean I can't send it to other libraries. So what's your take? Um, let me just look at it. I always like to read. Uh, <laughs> it helps me. Yeah, I don't know. Um, your song cannot then be placed with any other library or organization. Okay, that's or sold or marketed by yourself. Yeah, I mean, to me, just based on that one sentence, that's they're telling him you can't sell your music, that they're the exclusive company to do that. Um, which, frankly, okay, so he didn't, he said he was contacted by them, but he didn't sign it. So I'm glad about that because, I mean, for me, like, I would want to carve that out and say, well, no, he should be allowed to sell his album. But that's going to be in virtually all music library contracts, many of yeah. them. For the exclusive companies, I think that that, because well, we get asked about this Really? A lot. Because yeah. from the ones that I've seen, they, they're usually not prohibiting the sale. 
because they're really supposed to be focusing on the synchronization placement, not album sales. So he would be wise to contact an attorney and, and get if a sentence or two that could be stuck in there that correct. says, with the exception of... Right, yeah. And then the deal's kosher. I mean, not that it's Hopefully. not kosher well, now, but... based on that one sentence. I mean, we don't yeah. know We don't know what's in the, the rest of the deal. But, um, yeah, and if they're not willing to change that, then maybe that you should think twice about signing with them. I, I've seen this in... Contracts from very reputable yeah. companies that have been around for a long time, but I have a feeling that most would say okay yeah, because they know the probability of them making any money from album sales with you selling your own product. Right. Well, look, and if I, they want to be like a publisher, then, you know, maybe, okay, if you want to take, you know, some sort of cut, I mean, at least don't prevent an artist from selling their album. Right. I mean, that, I mean, to me, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> but he, he's not saying they're preventing. Yeah. He's saying, you know, they would probably, you know, well, he's want not sure. and he doesn't want to give it to him. Well, he and, said, does this mean I can no longer promote and sell my album or that they get a cut of the albums I sell? I mean, he's not sure which way it goes. And, you know, based on that one sentence, it sounds like they're not letting him sell it. Um, my guess is so, they'd be happy to let them sell it as long as they were getting paid for their percentage of the I would hope so. You know, and again, there could be something else in the contract that clarifies that further, and, and right. we're just going off this one sentence. Um, Lawyers but, are so careful, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's my I job. Know. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I would say, Brandon, get a lawyer to look at this if it's a company you're interested in. Um, you know, or anybody that, that has a deal that on their desk that is something similar to this get a lawyer in this kind of situation because you don't want to sign a deal where you're unsure of something like this um you know you don't want yeah. to sign a deal that you don't understand the terms of um let's deal yeah. with jesse's question okay. right underneath because yeah. uh, i know you did this one at the road rally and yeah. it's a, maybe the most frequently asked and question. i love this question yeah, go ahead <laughs> you, you can read it too. okay so jesse peck says i always copyright my work but can a date and time stamp on your newly uploaded project stand as a copyright um okay so when you create a work and you the legal language is fix it in a tangible medium of expression which is something physical tangible that you can reproduce like a recording you write it down you record it you video yourself singing it something like that um it is technically copyrighted under the law however if you need to prove a date of creation you need there's an infringement issue you need to be in court the court only cares about your federal copyright registration they don't i mean yeah it's okay it's some evidence if you're like look i filmed the video on such and such a day but that's not what a court's going to rely on and you can't even sue in federal court without a federal copyright registration with the Library of Congress, and the people, Copyright Office. People confuse the copyright with the registration of right. the copyright. Right. So it is copyrighted the minute they create it. If you write it down on this piece right. of paper, if you put it on a cassette, yeah. if you were to carve it into a log with a razor blade, <laughs> technically it's copyrighted. How reproducible is that? <laughs> Uh, well, you could have a bunch yeah, of monks yeah, on the top know. of a mountain that also, but who knows. But Carving it in. Yeah, it, right. it's, it's the registration right. is and, everything. And the thing is, is that this is like, you know, it's like goes back to that poor man's copyright where people are like, oh, if you mail it to yourself, then the postmark counts. Well, no, not really. Um, and, you know, and, and the thing is, is that I've, you know, I have like artist managers tell me and I go okay great have you copyrighted everything for the artist do I need to take care of that um you know oh well the, the time stamp you know that that counts we don't need to and I'm like oh my god you know and these are people that are advising artists right so and um, it just sometimes it's a little bit of a frustration I have to say no that's actually not the case we need to register it and you know, and, you know, I have no problem because my job is to protect my artist client. So I have yeah. no problem saying, you're wrong. We need to do it this way. And then the manager walks and out, the manager gets in their gets car. Really mad. I'll show you what the manager does. I'll be right back. <laughs> the manager gets one of these. Right. Oh, a little dusty. Sorry. The manager gets one of these and starts putting pins, pins in the little yeah. Arendelle. Yeah. That doesn't look like me, though. No. <laughs> 
actually, this one looks more like me, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I've got little taxis all <laughs> it over. It has little taxis. <laughs> this is true. So, yeah. Um, so, register your work. It's not expensive. You know, so. Can we talk about yeah. work for hire for a moment? Yeah, we um, can. You know, in our world, in the yes. music library world, yes. um, if I'm a composer, yes. but I don't play harp, and okay. you do, and you're my friend, and I call you up and say, yo, Aaron, can you schlep your harp over here <laughs> to my studio tonight? Sure, I'll schlep it. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, and play me a glissando at the end of this piece, and you do it for me for free, or maybe for 50 bucks, and I give you a hug, you walk out the door, and we're done. And then a year later, I go to license that piece in something, um, whether it's signing a deal with a library or licensing it directly to a supervisor. And I've not done a work for hire um, contract release right. with you. Technically, can you come after me for any portion of the income? Why are libraries, well, why do okay, people care so, about that document? So, all right. So, yes and no. I mean, in practice, it doesn't happen that often. Could I come after you? Well, I think there's there's two aspects to it could I come to you and say Michael I'm you know I deserve songwriting credit you know that's one aspect or I could just say Michael I played on that so I deserve some sort of royalty or maybe I should have an interest in the master or mm -hmm. something like that so there's different aspects to that but I think the songwriting thing happens more than the master thing so and then it's like well did I just come in and play exactly what you told me like you had it all laid out and you're like here Aaron play this and I'm like okay do 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 <laughs> and um and, and that's and then I give you a hug and I leave right or is it like am I really contributing something to this I mean are we collaborating and then but at that point when you don't have a songwriter agreement in place like a songwriter split agreement in place then it becomes your word against mine. Right. So I could walk out and go, no, I contributed all this stuff, and you said I could have 10%, and da-da-da. And then you're like, no, I didn't. I just, I just asked you to come in and play this one piece that I had already written. <laughs> and it really um, only matters when the song starts to earn big bucks. Exactly. And, but that has happened. I mean, I've seen this situation happen. And it's not only like a musician that comes in and plays. It's like the band member's girlfriend that was hanging out in the studio and I've seen this happen and then the song starts making money and then the girlfriend's now the ex-girlfriend and then she comes back and she's like, you said that I could have 10% because I contributed that line to the song or something and and they're like, no, we didn't and and then it becomes a he said, she said and, it, and there was one particular situation that I was aware of where the band actually had to give her the 10% because they did not have proof that she didn't write it. She didn't have proof that she did write it, but they didn't have proof that she didn't write it. So, I mean, that's the time where... So it's going to be cheaper to give her the 10% than exactly. way to Exactly. So then, you know, that's the time. It's like I always urge people, do a songwriter split agreement at the time that you're writing the song with, with people. And... Yeah. I mean, you know, you can get that from your attorney. I mean, I have a template for that on Indie Artist Resource that's, you know, you can just download and use. I would imagine that your templates yeah. um, are very desirable, that you get a lot of customers for those, because most people don't have the resources right. to spend the money on an attorney for a smallish agreement, you know, for, for mm -hmm. one piece of instrumental music. Is, right. it, is it worth several hundred dollars? No. Um, I know. Aaron's right. thinking, no, no, don't say that. Right. No, uh, well, but, but, but this is part of the reason why I started Indie Artist Resource, because right. there was this population of artists, of writers, of musicians that needed protection like this, but weren't getting it for that reason, right? right? Um, so, so I said, well, how about there's this template that they can go on, they can download, they pay once, and then they just keep using it over and over again. How do you... Uh, protect yourself as an attorney, it, it, isn't that dangerous for attorneys um, to have templated stuff like that because... Yeah, you know. I have a lot of disclaimers. Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting next you know, to the and, disclaimer queen. And, here. well, you know, and, and I, yeah, I mean, it's just there's, you know, I, I wanted it to be available for people yeah, because make, they it, need it. it so, they you know, they just, they need to read the disclaimers. They need to understand... 
what's involved, that this is not something that's tailored to their specific situation. Now I have drafted the templates for the needs of independent musicians. So it's not like some random thing that you're downloading right. for free that doesn't even apply to you. Um, <laughs> but it's not the same as if you came to me as a client and said, Aaron, draft this for this situation that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. Whereas it would be very tailored to that specific situation. This is a general template that you fill in the blanks yourself. And it comes and, with and instructions. A work but, for hire would be a great example of when that would come in handy. <clears throat> Right. And, you know, and, and yeah, and I mean, but there's certain things, there's certain criteria about when things can be a work for hire and when they can't. And Do you remember the mm -hmm. Rod Stewart song, Do You Think I'm Sexy? Yes. Da, 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 I know da, that da. song. <laughs> I was actually vacuuming the carpet of Criteria Studios lobby, Studio C's lobby. Yeah. And the producers working on that record were playing pinball, mm -hmm. and I interrupted them to say, how do you make a hit record? And they looked at me like, you're 19, shut up, you've got a vacuum cleaner in your hand. They were very nice gentlemen. But that's how a lot of people start, is vacuuming <laughs> yeah. the studio. So, so uh, yeah. But on the other side of the wall, from four feet away, yeah. I could hear, wah, 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 which became the hook of the song. Right. And that would be a great example of... The keyboard player's name was Dwayne Hitchings, mm -hmm. and he was the keyboard player on the session that came up with that line. And I think there may have been a lawsuit down the line about that, well, but that's, that's a significant contribution. Right. Yeah, no, that is. And I mean, even, you know, this, it happens so often where it's like you go in the studio, you record, and you don't get agreements with the musicians, with the engineers, with the, you know. I, when my clients are recording an album, or a song or whatever, I tell them you need agreements with all these people. And they're like, why? And then the, and then <laughs> and then they'll inevitably be this actually happened with a client. I'm like explaining this all to them about why they need these agreements. And so these people don't come back to them and try and claim ownership of things. And then boom, there's an article in the news that some engineer or studio owner or something was suing to get part master ownership of something uh, they had recorded and I'm like this is why I tell you that we need these yeah. agreements and this is why I do these for you so yeah yeah I gave them an extra 25 hours for free <laughs> so I mowed something right yeah yeah um what's next uh, what do I don't got? have anything else okay. um, do you have you have some I have that other people stuff. sent to you well I mean this is I mean part of this is kind of okay so Ed Sweet sent in a question to me okay. this morning and I, I believe he's a taxi member as well um, and he said you know I mean some of this is stuff we covered about giving up your publishing on a more traditional song versus an instrumental cue can you still market your songs and sell them um, without Cutting in the library, well, that depends on the deal, as we saw in that other question. Um, could they turn down a deal that you got for an artist to record a song, or would they typically be willing to say yes to the opportunities you get on your own? Again, that kind of is going to depend on the deal, but that, that relates actually to another question that someone sent in um, about approvals for songs. Like, can you, do you, as a writer, as an artist, when you sign with these libraries, do you have any say as to what your music actually gets used for? Which really comes down to porn, uh, yeah, oftentimes. Yeah, mostly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's the big one. Yeah. That's the big one is porn. Sometimes it's firearms. Sometimes it's politics. Right. Um, and then depending on the artist or the writer, it can, I mean, I've negotiated, you know, all kinds of other things that they don't want their music used for. And, but, you know, that's, that's fine if they feel passionate. I mean, an example of that could be, like, if you're vegan, you probably don't want your music in a commercial for the meat industry. You know, like, if you're an animal rights advocate and you're vegan and you don't want it for meat. I'm keeping know? my mouth shut. I got yeah. in trouble last week. Okay. I sent out an email. There's a marketing segment called yeah. Grumpy Old Men. And it's for men who are 50 years old or older. So I sent out an email saying, male musicians who are yeah. over 50, think about using your music as your um, investment portfolio. There's really no risk. Yeah. You know, it's not like right. buying stocks or bonds or anything. You go up and down. Yeah. It's, and at the bottom of this 2,000-word like, email that I sent out, I said, 
P.S. This is also, you know, uh, I, I think I was giving a discount on taxi, mm -hmm. and the discount is also for women. I didn't yeah. want to exclude them. Right. I got four emails from some very upset ladies <laughs> that I was, you know, micro, what's the word, micro uh, something, uh, microaggression yeah. toward women. I included the ladies. Anyway, so I'm not even touching vegans because right. those, those people. Yeah. <laughs> They, they don't like their meat. No, but I mean, but that's just an example. I mean, there's there's always, you know, if you're really passionate about some yeah. cause or something like that, then you're not going to want your music used for something that's not that cause. And I think the more reputable companies will let you... Um, opt have, out. Yeah, mm. opt out. I mean, I've, I mean, like I've said, I've negotiated deals where I've had like five different opt outs for like causes that the musician was really passionate about i think you should at least get the like the porn or the nc-17 one in there and i think if a company is really not willing to put something like that in then maybe you want to think twice because i mean does the company really need that much control like you get no say and we can put it in anything we want the problem becomes a logistical one and, right. and, a, and, and a that's ticking why they clock. limit it yeah, yeah because if they get a call from you know music soup who's on the mix stage of a movie right. and something just fell out and they put in a replacement track and they need to know right now yeah. can we use that because right. this is over a scene that shows right. some body parts right. and they can't wait for somebody three right. hours later or a day later right. to call them back right yeah, so, and that and it makes complete sense, but I think that's why having it in the contract ahead of time, I mean, like, if there's nudity, but it's not to the level of pornography or NC-17, then probably the library is able to say, yeah, it's okay, you can use it. Or, But if you have things in the contract saying, like, no porn, no guns, no what po politics, mm -hmm. you know, for example, which are the most common, um, you know, then the library knows, oh, all right, well, we can't use it for that or something. And sadly, you, know? you can have your TV on at 7 p.m. and have your, like, eight-year-old daughter hear about erectile dysfunction. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, that's TV for you. Yeah. You know, I don't watch that much. <laughs> um, so I don't watch the news. Are you a Netflix abuser? No, I just... <laughs> Try and do other things with my time. Spend a lot of time looking yeah. at and then a lot carve of times, outs. Carve outs, <laughs> yeah. and then a lot of times I'm at, you know, things that, like, you know, I'm doing this, or I'm, I'm at a, another speaking event, or right. I'm whatever. So, yeah. It's Hard-working lady. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's take some talk? questions yeah. from All you right. guys, do too, we because we... That... Did anyone send uh, any in? It'll take a while. There's a little delay, like a 45-second okay. delay. So, yeah, send in some questions, okay. guys. send in questions, guys. Um, otherwise, you know, I'll see what else people sent me here. Um, uh, okay, that was the question I just answered. You know, <laughs> we should create a Ask the Attorney yeah uh thing on our forum because so many people will answer legal questions for their friends and be wrong yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're not doing it to be jerks right. about it no they're, they're really they're, trying to help yeah right. they're just misinformed somewhere yeah. or the rules have changed right. or laws have changed right. and, well yeah i saw that somebody sent me a youtube video that somebody did and it was like this youtube video for musicians and it was that question that we answered before about the the date and the time stamping for the poor man's copyright and they're going yeah you're cool with that man and I'm, you know, so I posted on this thing. I'm like, no, you're not cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just don't. I mean, the thing is, is that it really breeds these misconceptions. It's that it's like that thing where, oh, if you use um, like three notes of another song, you know, it's not copyright infringement. That's not true. <laughs> that was my question that oh, I forgot before. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, That's not true. We had a... One of our screeners heard yeah. a song the other day and said, this sounds incredibly familiar to me. Oh, I've had that. <laughs> and, 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 and he yeah. sent me, it was like over a weekend, yeah. and he emailed me the taxi member song and the song that was, had like 33 million downloads yeah. or views on, um, right. on YouTube. And they were remarkably similar. I mean, it, it clearly came from the same track. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't just somewhat similar. It was right. remarkably yeah. similar. Came to find out, one of the guys on my staff, Anthony, had a brilliant idea, said, so let's Shazam it. Yeah. Turns out that everybody had used the same beats that they bought from oh. a library. 
Yeah. But it had the same synth sound, right. the same synth part, right. the same drum beats. Ugh. There was so much yeah, stuff that was identical. Yeah. Even even lyrics on it were identical. Right. How the hell do these companies get away with selling that? And why would a major label want to put out an artist whose song is like 90% right. out of a box? Right. So where's the world going with yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's when I have... I have some clients that work with Beats, and when and when, like in one particular client, when she was doing her album, we, you know, I, I, looked at the contracts and I I drafted in the contracts things, and you know we tried to buy them out and things like that because I said, do you want you know twelve other people using the same beat that's in your song? And we looked at that very consideration and did as much as we could to prevent that it used to be yeah. beats were beats i mean it was right. just drums then it became drums right. and a bass part now it's like a whole instrumental track yeah it's know? a record and without somebody, a vocal yeah, exactly. yeah. i, I <laughs> didn't like, know uh, that i didn't yeah. know that it had gone that far yeah. so i was quite astounded right and 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 because of the internet then it's like you know there was there was another situation where somebody was using this beat and then they I'm like, great, okay, who wrote the beat? You know, let's get the license, blah, blah, blah. Oh, they pulled it off SoundCloud. And I'm like, who did they pull it off SoundCloud from? I don't know. I said, you know what? <laughs> you need to redo the track with a yeah. new beat or don't use that track because we don't know where that beat came from. And you don't need somebody, all of a sudden I get a letter saying, oh, you represent so-and-so and they're infringing on our beat. Aaron, it's more money for you. <laughs> well, I know, but <laughs> the, the point is, I mean, as nice as that is, the point is, is that, you know, I try and keep my clients out of these situations that is my job to protect my clients to care about them and their careers and keep them out of situations like that right because that and, will ultimately get you more clients well, because you know well, but it's you no, know it's, it's, it's good i mean doing the right thing yeah, it's an integrity pay, thing yeah too, should pay off me. with so, a reward I mean, for, yeah. yeah i got into this business to protect artists and musicians and help them structure their careers in a sustainable way for themselves. Why music? Why did you? I just always loved music. Yeah. yeah Are you a musician big... yourself? No, that's the thing. I'm like the professional appreciator. Wow. Um, but just, you know, I mean, I was like third grade. I was like Elvis Presley's number one fan, you know, and the other kids are like, he's dead. What are you <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't a pretty death, I might but add. No, but, you know, but I just, you know, I've always just really loved music and didn't know what there was to do in music besides be a musician. But then when I was in college, I started taking music industry classes because my school had a program yeah. at USC. And then I'm like, oh, here's what an agent does. Here's what a manager does. And then they're like, okay, now we're going to explain these things called copyrights. And now we're going to look at these recording contracts. And I'm going... That's cool. That's so interesting. So you had no desire to become an attorney prior to that? I did when I was a kid and then like forgot about all that right. and thought I was going to be a doctor. And then I got into college and I was like, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. So I'm um, assuming you have Jewish parents. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are exactly. Just, all exactly. Jewish kids will tell yeah. you you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. Right. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then it became, oh, I'm going to work in music. And my mom's going... Oh my gosh, she's gonna drop out of school and go on the road with a band. And I'm like, no, I just I'm gonna, you know, have a job. I just don't know what it is. And then when I figured out lawyer, music lawyer, she, oh okay, she'll be a lawyer. All right, right everything's good now. <laughs> my parents also freak because yeah. um, I grew up in a family-owned yeah. business in a small town, and it was always assumed that I would either come home and, and join in the business right. or go to law school or right. med school. And I just wasn't smart enough, and I didn't give a damn about school. So. At some point, I got into the music industry, and about a year or two later, my parents came to Miami where I was living and working, mm -hmm. and they came to the studio to take me out to dinner, and I was working with Rod Stewart. And I came out of the control room to meet my parents yeah. at, the, at the front desk, and Rod Stewart came out shortly thereafter. I said, Rod, I'd like to meet my parents, right. Fred and Fran. He shook their hands. My mother goes, I always thought you were much taller. <laughs> but from that moment forward, it was okay that I yeah. was in the music okay. industry because I was working with right. Rod Stewart. Right, right. Well, yeah, that's good. That's All right, good. questions. Uh, do, we, do we have some? Yeah. I hope so. As we're as we're just you yeah. know, reminiscing here. <laughs> No, it can't be all work. Okay, uh, question. If a library wants your copyright and master, but you have not registered the copyright, 
can you register it then and maybe still be okay? So, so library... you haven't given it to the library yet, but you haven't registered, so you want to register it and then give it to the library. I don't... Yeah, I, don't I think that's a, what they... Yeah, do. I don't see a problem there. And yeah. is it true, or is this urban myth, that you don't have to wait for the copyright registration form to come back to you, that once, if you've got proof that you right. send, send it in, it. you're good? Yeah, well, yeah, because, I mean, it takes a while for the registration certificate to get to you Long they're, they're pretty backed up over there so um yeah so i mean as you if you've sent it in you're you should be okay i went to room b14 in the library of congress which is the room where all copyright registrations go and it's down in the basement that's what the b stands for and there are three women that work there in this giant room of paper yeah just giant that's why room. they switched to online they're like we don't want the paper anymore it, it was they, I am not kidding when yeah. I tell you that I saw pieces of parchment with string yeah. tied around them sitting on those metal carts that you used yeah. in grade school to move the projector from right. room to room. They actually had these metal carts with parchment. Yeah. Uh, they probably yeah. were still sitting there waiting for the registrations probably. to go through. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do one on there? Or should we go back to the ones that got sent in? Uh, if the song is as good as the one you're accidentally came out, that's not a question. Okay. <laughs> Question, in a question. contract, it specifies I can't use AFM um, members, yeah. not recorded by a union member, uh, and speaks to new use fees and reuse fees. What is this about? So do you want to take this, uh, parse it out? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't actually get too involved with the union stuff. Um, so AFM is the musician's union, um, and if you're... A union member they have a lot of rules about how you get paid for sessions mm -hmm. and things like that and there's overtime and and that sort of things um so this particular library apparently does not want recordings that use union members on there because they don't want to deal with the regulations and having to pay people right because the, they might the have paid new, demo scale for the right. session but now they're going to license so the it new use and the reuse fees has to do with i mean those are like union terms again about like what you get paid for certain uses mm -hmm. um so yeah, I mean, he doesn't say exactly how they reference the new use and the reuse fees. My guess is that that library probably doesn't want to pay those or is going to somehow make the the artist or the writer responsible for those because that happens sometimes. Um, but it seems like they don't want union people involved at all. So, so I mean, basically, I would say the umbrella answer for that is, is that... Um, they don't want your track to have union members on it. And if it does, they don't want it. And this is a big issue yeah. in Nashville in particular because right. the union is very strong and active right. there um, and does a lot of great things for yeah. people. Um, however, you have guys that will do off-card sessions mm -hmm. and uh, you have guys that are union members that do on-card sessions and do it at demo scale. Yeah. Yeah. And then somebody who's not very wise about the ways of the industry will take that demo it sounds like a record for right. all practical purposes, submit it to taxi or library, what have you, and forget to mention that they paid demo scale with union guys right. on it, and now it gets on an episode in Nashville. Right. Oops, you're yeah. in big trouble Oops. because Payments. you have to pay yeah. um, whatever that much yeah. higher payment is. Right. So, yeah, um, I have implored the folks at the good union, the AF of, AF of M, in Nashville to work something out so that it benefits their members and the people that need to use their members on their thing because yeah. it's a different world. It's a yeah. new world. Yeah. Um, go with it. Go with it. <laughs> Just go with it. Yeah. Uh, for, let's see. First song, uh, 10, no. Uh, they want to know there's one about copywriting one song at a time or a whole uh, group at a time. Um, well, he says as a group project, I'm assuming that just means a group of songs at a time. Not, no, they're still copyrighted. So, I mean, if you're on a budget you and you're doing an album, let's say you can do like all 12 songs at once. You could send in, um, I think it's called a PAU. Um, I want to say, I forget the type yeah, they of copyright. Don't use, yeah, they don't use, use the terms as much because those are really for the paper applications that are getting away from them. <laughs> so, yeah. what if you have... Yeah. 30 cues that you right. created over a weekend. Uh, yeah. And by the way, a lot of the guys right. I know that do cues don't yeah. even bother registering them. Right. 
Um, on one hand, some of the libraries will register yeah. them for them. Right. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I think that they see each queue as being so not all that valuable. Yeah. That was really good syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, that, why bother? Why bother, yeah. Uh, and then that'll be the one that ends up in a giant motion picture. Probably, for yeah. For the next 30 years, right. it'll be all over but, TV. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have a group of songs, it's okay to register them as a group. Um, it doesn't lessen their copyright or anything like that. This is a very good question okay. from my friend Vicki Flawith. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Vicki. Um, she's awesome. She's been around here forever, and she's okay. a really awesome lady. If you don't live in the States, does Library of Congress registration hold up in a court of law uh, in Canada, right. for example? So the... There are countries that have sort of reciprocal, there's like a whole convention of countries that have gotten together and, and basically they're supposed to recognize each other's registrations. Um, so it's not, it's not like you would register an international registration, but they are supposed to, um, you know, recognize the registration from your home country. Um, so it shouldn't be, I mean, I don't know what the situation is that she's referring to but in general you know that's you know generally they're supposed to be recognized and so hopefully it won't be a problem what about companies that aren't so good about recognizing the reciprocity um let's say i mean china is obviously a huge yeah. potentially huge market um and let's say that I write a song, copyright it, Library of Congress in the U.S., um, and it gets picked up for a movie that turns into a giant smash hit in China. Um, am I going to have a hard time getting paid on um, that, or are they just going to bootleg the crap out of the movie? And well, I mean, I think it depends. I'm not... I would have to look, because there's so many countries, you have to look specifically at the list of who's in on this convention and who's not. And I, um, So depending on their involvement with with this convention um that factors into it and then that sometimes it's like maybe you need to bring a litigator into the situation oh great you know? oh let's, good let's you know? sue kim jong il or whatever yeah. which are one of the kim jongs um for copyright infringement yeah. in north korea that would be costly mm -hmm. uh, when i was a minor i signed my stepfather's name to a publishing contract oh. interesting am i dead in the water to get my song back um well that's that sounds like like fraud to me. <laughs> so, kind of like, huh? <laughs> um, I think you should consult a litigator for that. Um, and you might not want to put that in print in a public yeah, place in the exactly. future. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Because, yeah, that could be used as evidence. Right. It's not hearsay anymore, right? Yeah. Um, you know, because these are people saying how long it took them to get their registration. I'm telling you, I so, saw parchment yeah. Yeah. in there. It takes a um, while. Um, do you want me to go over something else sure. that you're looking? Yes, um, please. So, um, you know, one person asked about, uh, you know, which we kind of touched on, signing over copyright um, with, uh, with no advance. And, I mean, I'm not an advocate of that because why would you just give away your copyright for free to somebody else? But um, it's a personal choice, really. Um and then, you know, they asked, uh, is the sync tracks for the writers or the owners of the recording or both? And that's going to depend on the deal that you sign because, as I mentioned in the beginning, si some libraries will be the master recording representative for licensing. Some will not. Uh, so that just depends on the deal that you're, that you're doing. Um, and uh, and then there was actually another good question about um, co-writers and uh, if if you co-wrote a song with other people, can you be the person to license it? And how does that work? And, and that's becoming more sticky by the day. Right. So really, um, so in that situation, what... Now, copyright for joint works does allow for any one of the owners of a joint work to grant a non-exclusive license um, as long as they account to the other owners. So, like, if we wrote a song together and I wanted to enter into some non-exclusive sync license, um, 
you know, and they paid me 500 bucks and we're 50-50 split, I would have to give you 250, you know. So, so you have to pay the people you're supposed to pay. But um, in other situations, and to be safe, because in practice in the music industry, like a company licensing a song do doesn't want to be in a situation where then, you know, in, in our example, then my, maybe Michael would go, I didn't say that mm -hmm. you could use it. So they will actually, whether copyright says you can make that license or not, they'll go to me and to you because they don't want to get in trouble or have a dispute or have somebody creating drama. Um, That's a good word yeah, for it. Yeah, drama. <laughs> but in a situation like this, what you can do is you can have an administration agreement with your co-writer. So like you and I could have a deal where it would be like, okay, we're both 50-50 on this song, but I'm going to be the administrator and I'll administer your share and I'll handle all the licenses and I'll pay you. And do you, you get know? paid the admin fee? Do you get an extra 10% Depends because you're doing... Depends on the deal. Depends on what you draft up with your people. You, so, you probably should. Yeah, you probably doing, should, yeah. If yeah. you're doing the extra work, then you probably should. But, you know, there are some people that might say, well, I would do it for my share anyway, so I don't care. But, yeah, usually, I mean, you would get... The administration fee but but that would be the way to handle that situation so that a company wouldn't have to go to you know your three other co-writers as well and, and you could just handle it and you could say well i have this administration agreement with my co-writers we had a question go by that i'm only going to mention in brief but it's the mm -hmm. first time in five-year history okay. of doing taxi tv i've ever seen anybody say would you handle my divorce then marry me and i think they were talking to you <laughs> 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 it's way up there now, oh, okay. but I think I'm pretty well, sure I saw that. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I don't do divorce law, but um, yeah. Uh, I see right. something about a PRO. Do we? Is that a which one? That one? Yeah. Is that okay. if you don't copyright a, a piece you submit to a library and it gets licensed for no sync fee, how can your PRO pay you? Um, in other words, can I mm -hmm. register? uncopyrighted songs with my PRO? That's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, well, because again, it's like they are copyrighted when they're created. So Just you, not registered. You can, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't remember if the application asks for the registration number of the PRO, like when you're right. registering the song. I can't remember if they, because a lot of times, because um, I do those, but sometimes the client does them themselves so I would think um, it would I would think it would too so you know but the PRO registration doesn't give you any sort of copyright protection um, so I would copyright them anyway before you register them this brings up but, a, a great yeah. point I, I was on the phone the other day with a friend of mine who's a, a, a real music supervisor yeah. on real TV yeah. shows and we were talking about taxi members getting taxi member music to him and he yeah. said um oh, i kind of lost my train of thought but i basically i don't want to deal with the public i don't want yeah. these people following up with me what were we just talking about copyright registrations and PROs. oh and he said i he specifically said i don't want to get an email or a phone call from anybody that i ask is your do you have a publisher and they go yes ask <laughs> That's my other favorite question, yeah. and I've actually had, this is another situation where I've had, I had a manager tell one of my artist clients, you need to register with BMI. BMI is one of the nation's largest music publishers. Of course and they I are. Went, oh, man. Stop. <laughs> do not do anything. We are having a conference call, and we are discussing this, and I said, Mr. Manager, that is not correct. BMI is a performance rights organization. They are not a music publisher. Mm. Um, I would say half the people yeah. in the world, in our world, yeah. think that they are a publisher or yeah. that ASCAP is a publisher. Yeah. It's scary. They are not. I just signed a deal with ASCAP. Yeah. That's great. ASCAP will collect and pay you your performance royalties only. That's what they do. You mean they're not going to shop my music? No. <laughs> they All are right. not. Uh, if a library... I just rub my eye now. I've got mm. something... Glitching it out. Uh, if a library wants one of your songs, right. but your song is registered as part of a work with the Library Congress, so right, collective works of, how hard is it to separate that song from the collective works, and do you have to? Well, what, like, 
Is that like you registered it as a group or? I think that's what they mean because they say uh, registered as part of a work. Well, but part of a work and just registering a group of works together is different. different. So I'm not sure. I mean, part of a work, I mean, it's like, are you taking the harp part out and using that, you know, which might be like a derivative work? I'm not, I'm not really sure what they're asking. All right. So that is making it a little difficult Hard to for answer. me to answer. Yeah. All right. We've got like five to okay. seven more minutes. Okay. Let's go pick a juicy one out All here. All right. Um, juicy one. Yeah. I'm looking. <laughs> as far as nice as any other. We're reading. Yeah. That's why we're like, <laughs> people <laughs> are watching. Both leaning in. Please frame with two dopey people <laughs> looking at the screen. Okay, so as, as far as non-exclusive deals with okay. different libraries, yeah. can the composer producer just change the EQ on one instrument for each version of the same recording, and would that constitute actually having a different recording, even though technically all the different recordings would sound the same? Would this work for a non-exclusive deal? But it's deal? still the same song. It's the same notes. It still sounds the same, you know, even if it's like in a different key or like yeah. it's a little bit different. So it's still, it's the same song. E even yeah. beyond EQ, if you change like the hi-hat or right. something, it's still substantially the same. Yeah. And that's the test, right? Is substantial something well, or Well, for infringement, it's substantial similarity. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, in this case, it would, again, be maybe looking at more like a derivative work issue. Um which is, I mean, I like a derivative of your own song, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to make that much difference. Uh, let's else? see, question, if you don't copyright a That's piece. That's the one we did already. Um, okay, I'm going to scroll down okay. a little later in the show. If you know, nope, same one. That person okay. keeps sending the same one. <laughs> All right, well, we answered it now. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, hmm. Question, I have a company out of the country that wants my song. Where can I get legal advice for out of the country Hire deals? Hire a lawyer. Uh, and, and like, yeah. so would you be capable of, can they hire somebody in the U.S. to do a deal with North Korea? Well, yeah, <laughs> yes, but then it depends. Um, it depends what law the contract is under. So I'm assuming... And I could be wrong because it depends on the deal that I haven't seen. But, you know, oftentimes when a deal is coming in from another country, that the company in that country is drafting it under the laws of that country. So sometimes yeah. your attorney here in the U.S. may need to check with an attorney in that country. Um, or maybe you want to hire an attorney in that country. But, good luck with um, that. Yeah, good luck with that. So I would say hire an attorney here who's probably either going to be familiar with it or we'll be able to contact another attorney there or research the issue and just um, check it out. But in any case, you know, if it's something you're not familiar with, you need to hire an attorney on that one. So, all right, that looks like the same question. Uh, Blasted okay. seventy seven says ASCAP okay. doesn't ask for copyright. Right. And yeah, you can I didn't, get paid for use. I didn't time. think that they that they did ask for the registration number from. They pay the by the Q sheet, which yeah. the show submits. Right. Um, how hard is it? I get asked this question mm -hmm. pretty frequently. If you are sitting at home and you're watching an episode of something on TV and you hear a cue or a song that mm -hmm. you know is yours, right. um, and it turns out that it wasn't put on the cue sheet, but you were able to DVR it or record yeah. it in some, you know, could hold your phone up and record right. it. How hard is it then to take that evidence and go to your PRO and get them to squeeze the, the network to pay you the money? Right. I mean, again, it just depends on the situation and how, you know, because again, like was a library involved in that too, you know, right. because in that, in that situation, maybe you want to go to the library and say, well, the library has this cue and, you know, I heard it on such and such and did you get that placement and, and they've you know, got a vested kind of, interest. So right. they, it may yeah. fall into so, their so cracks. They and they're might go, do Thanks. that work for you. But I mean, the PRO's job is to work for its members. So, I mean, they should be wanting to investigate that. I mean, but luckily got, that hasn't happened for my clients that often. But. How many members does ASCAP well, or BMI? Lot, I mean, a couple hundred thousand Well, people. yeah, they have a lot, but still, 
you know, like anything in your career, you have to be diligent about it. So BMI, ASCAP, whatever, they're, they might not follow up with it. You have to follow up with it. And that's anything. Mm -hmm. That's anything. So Advocate for yourself. Yeah, Get somebody you else to. to do the work. Yeah. So because, you know, if you just wait around for other people to do it for you, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. Oh, wait. I'm <laughs> Did you see what I just saw? Was that the... Uh, yeah, that's the one, yeah. Okay. More, um, more romantic proposals happening here. No, you actually want your mother. Oh. Aaron, yeah. if I were 20 years younger, I'd want to date your mother. Okay. <laughs> He's calling himself old. Right. Um, okay, got that, that one, was right? the one we did. Yeah. That's it. If you've registered 10 songs together and need Isn't to... Isn't that kind of the same one that uh, yeah. we answered already? Yep. Um, all right. So going to find one, one last question that we haven't answered yet. Okay, that's the same one practice, again at the bottom. Do you practice law in California? Yes, she yes, does. Yes, I do. And how do you hire me? Um, you can go to my website at themusicindustrylawyer.com. There's a contact form and you can send me an email and... Tell me your situation, and, and then we can talk and um, discuss what you need. And, and by the way, I just want to say there are very few music attorneys that actually know anything about the library business. Yeah. So many uh, attorneys that I've met over the years, and, and I know many of them, some of them really, really huge attorneys um, that have done deals for tens of millions of dollars, they don't understand this world yeah. because they don't live in this world. Right. And so when they hear film and TV sync, they think of, you know, uh, a Michael Jackson song making it into a movie. Right. They don't understand a library right. and a little picture that's got, you know, a hundred cues in a library. So yeah. you want somebody. This is why I had Aaron at the rally was she actually knows this world. So, and for God's sake, please don't go to your father, right. brother-in-law, who went to law school and has been practicing real estate right. law in Chillicothe, <laughs> exactly. Ohio, for the last exactly. 30 years yeah. and took a music law course. Right. Yeah, and music law, I got it. Right. I got it because, they don't got it. No. They don't got it. <laughs> and most music attorneys won't. Seriously, I, yeah. I had to look... Um, uh, oh, gosh, Steve, what's his name? Winogradsky and I yeah. have been friends for... 20, yeah. 20 Steve's years. He's a friend of mine, too. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've had him on the show. He's been at the road rally and he couldn't do the road rally this year. And finding Aaron, hey. somebody <laughs> who actually knew yeah. this part of the industry. And I quizzed her to make sure that she really knew yeah. it before I would let her come to the rally because people that get this part of the industry are just too far and yeah. few and far between. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, Number songs. Okay, that's not a question. That was like almost a little song right there, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Uh, no. Question. There are only 12 notes in right. scale. Is it prudent for composers to carry E and O insurance? I don't know any composers that carry E and O insurance. Um, here's I mean, a you problem. You can if you want to, but E and O stands for errors and omissions, yeah. and I know of many, you know, I know of ten composers who have gotten so busy that they yeah. can't field all the requests for music right. that they get. So they start little libraries, yeah. and they've got a catalog with maybe 200, 500, mm -hmm. 1,000 songs in it. They don't have E and O insurance. Yeah, and it's getting so the networks don't want to work with people that don't have E and O insurance. Okay. But a lot of times, if they really like the music, they'll kind of look the right. other way. It's dangerous not to have it. Um, well, I think it depends when you're at that level versus, you know, you're, you know, and you have all these other libraries versus you're just composing and, you know, I think this... Yeah, but if you've got somebody else's music in your library and... Right, but this person, I think, is asking just for, because for we himself. should... Well, for himself, because we talked about that thing about how, like, three notes is still... Right. And, you know, there's not, like, an exception for that. So I think he's saying, like... Should he carry insurance in case he puts a certain amount of notes or the same combination of notes as something else in one of his compositions, like unknowingly that it, you know, right. that it might be in another composition? And I don't know any composers that 
that carry it for that purpose. And you know what? It'd be a lot cheaper because, you know, insurance can be quite expensive. Yeah. Um, probably just be cheaper to say, you know what? You're right. Here you go. Right. <laughs> I'm assigning <laughs> the copy. Yeah. yeah. Or take yeah. the whole damn yeah, thing. Yeah, take the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a lot cheaper. Which happens. I mean, that just happened with the Sam Smith song. Yep. Um, with Tom Petty. Um, I don't get people out of jail. Somebody's asking if I get people out of jail. No. <laughs> I, I call a colleague when that happens. All right. One last question. I know I said that already. Uh what about TV deals that are direct to the music supervisor? Is there a contract involved? Because if we get supervisors, uh, my experience yeah. is they send you a simple license agreement. Right. You agree yeah. to license us this song right. that you have right. uh, ownership or control right. of for this show right. for X amount of dollars right. and that there are no encumbrances. Thank yeah. you very much. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, it's basically sometimes it's just getting the basic terms, you know, this show, this timing, this price. This composer, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's not often like a long, drawn-out, 10-page agreement. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there should be something in writing. So <laughs> I had an embarrassing yeah. moment about five years ago. We got a taxi member's music into some big vitamin commercial or yeah. something. And, and it was tens of thousands yeah. of dollars. It was probably around a $65,000 thing. And we can't act as an agent or negotiate right. a deal. Right. Um, but we were, we said, you know what, we'll do some basic pre-clearance stuff for right. you. So I called up the, the creator of the music and I said, I need your copyright registration form. I need any work for hires that you've got. I need this. I need that. Send me all the stuff. And I FedExed it to the guy in New York at the ad agency. He fell out of his chair laughing. <laughs> he said, nobody in the history right. of doing business in, in the advertising world has right. ever sent me all this right. evidentiary right. stuff. Yeah. And apparently I was not yeah. cool for doing it. I was just trying to be... You know, I know. You were trying to do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Usually they're like... You you know you sign you own this. It doesn't infringe on anybody yeah. else's copyright. Sign here, okay. <laughs> and they've got you know yeah. insurance just in case you're lying or you're incorrect. All right, um, we've got to run because I've actually yeah. got a staff meeting. I actually yeah. wanted to take you out to dinner after okay. the show tonight, but I can't oh. because now I've or not well, staff meeting, but I've a got. Lot, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to have to give you a rain check. Okay. I thought about the, around three o'clock. Okay. I went, oh crap! I should call yeah. her. No, she's stuck in traffic. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I want to thank you for coming out here yeah, by taking you, you to dinner so yeah. that you didn't have to drive back right. in the traffic. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a rain check on okay. that. But um, tell everybody again the two website right. URLs. Okay, so one is themusicindustrylawyer.com, which is for my practice. And then the one with the template agreements and registrations and consultations is Indie Artist Resource, and that's indieartistresource.com. Um, and I also write a lot of articles and do speaking events and things so you can sign up on the email list so you can keep up with what She I'm will doing. be back at the Road Rally next year and <laughs> uh, we'll have her do one-to-one -one yeah. mentor sessions and panels, classes, yeah. whatever we can because okay. she she really nailed it. I was standing out in the audience going, my God, she's so good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for yeah, joining no, me, and, for me. And thank you guys for watching. Thanks for watching, guys. And we will see you next week on another <laughs> exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. <laughs> <laughs>